and today we are pleased to present Dressing Up a Gimlet Look at Fashions from a Century to go, a Century Ago. As this season of Downton Abbey winds down, what fun it is to host this program about clothing from the Victorian, Edwardian, and Flapper years. Ivan Ingerman, Professor of Graduate Costume Design at the University of Georgia's Department of Theater and Film Studies, is our presenter today. Ivan has lectured at FSU and NYU and has numerous credits for costume and set design for stage, screen, and TV, including commercials for Pier One, Toyota, BMW, MTV, stage shows for Disney on Ice, SeaWorld, and the Alliance Theater, and film credits for Suits, Escape to Life, and Rules of the Game, just to name a few, and I mean it, a few. <laughs> Ivan also runs his own entertainment design company, Ivan Ingerman Design. <clears throat> Following this part of the program, we hope you will visit the upstairs Heritage Room Gallery Reading Room to see an exhibition of period clothing and accessories put together by Beverly Bourgeois and Karen Fisher. Beverly is a local costumer and fashion historian and is the proprietor of Ritzy Rags. And Karen has studied and collected antiques for over 35 years and is owner of Antiques and Jewels on Millage Avenue. This evening's program is the second in a series we're calling Dust Collectors. In April, we will continue with an exhibition, lecture, and an antiques roadshow type event for antique toys. So check out our webpage, www.rslathens.org, in the coming weeks for details. And now please welcome Ivan Ingerman. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, first, I want to thank everyone from the athens Clark County Library for having me. Um, this, is, uh, this is a nice bit to get out of the, uh, the costume shop at uh, the Department of Theater and Film Studies and come out and share with you guys a few, uh, a few bits about what, um, what I do and what uh, we're doing at the department. Um, as you noticed earlier, we were having a little few technical difficulties, so we're still catching up there. But I'm going to start with um, just talking about the two pieces that we have on the stage today. Uh, we're very lucky to have um, a recent alumni from, uh, from my department, a student of mine that worked um, on uh, um, Boardwalk Empire. And if you're familiar with that show, it, um, it recently closed it, the last season. So a few months ago, we received this enormous three or four boxes sent to us from New York, filled with pieces like this that, um, that actually were on the show. Um, they are existent pieces. They are actual pieces from the period. Um, and you will notice um, some of the details. I'll start away from the microphone. Um, if you, and we couldn't really get in the light with the, um, with the projector, but, but the color, this is a pane velvet, um, pane velvet cape that's um, in the um, poro, poro um, uh, likeness, sort of orientalism that's happening, and we'll talk about that as soon as we get our, get our slides going on. But the, the shine that you get from it is it goes from being this very um, pale yellow to this really brilliant um, French yellow. Um, it's kind of a citrus linen uh, color from the period. And then the other dress, um, again, everything is hand beaded on, on silk chiffon. This is very light and very breezy. So you can imagine if this was in motion, how this would move. And that's what these dresses were made for, for movement, for dancing. This was not meant to be on a mannequin, obviously. Um, that's what this period was about. The 20s, they are on the move. They are ready to get on a plane, a train, uh, a ship, and get going uh, and enjoy life because we've just survived this 
uh, incredible, horrid time. And now it's, now it's a new time. Um, so you see this, this pattern here, I don't know if you can make it out, but it's in a butterfly, and the fabric is actually drawn up there and, and pleated, and it's got this just one little single piece here that lifts up um, and to complete that, um, that handkerchief hem there. Um, it's got another one in the back, at the very back, just to add to that little flapper motif, right? So um, uh, it's a beautiful piece here, the cape as well. You can see the lining of it is in um, is gold and lace. Um, and some of these laces are using actual metallic threads. So by the time they get to us, um, they're tarnished and have, have a different life. But at one time, they were quite brilliant and, and, uh, and gleaming. Uh, this one also, you can see how um, the... Orientalism is at play, obviously there. So um, this um, this was brought about with the um, sort of invasion of the Ballet Russe. If you're familiar with the Ballet Russe, yes. Um, so those uh, the aesthetic that was going on there was exotic. Uh, anything arabesque or um, chinois or very exotic, very um, otherworldly. You know, they were, they were not meant to represent real life. We want to know the exotic kind of um, Aladdin or, or um, these kind of fairy tale versions of, of a different place uh, and a different time. So this one is beaded. It has a little, it has a little shell on the inside. And um, I, wish it, I wish you could show this a little closer, but it's a little inset panel where the pleating there is um, fuller at the hip. And that's, um, that's something very indicative of this period as well. Um, so those are at least a very quick uh, look at these two ladies. Um, we just kind of quickly um, popped on a few little bits um, from a recent uh, show that we had there at, um, at the uh, university we recently did. Um, the Great Gatsby. Okay, so um, looks like I've got my notes. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so let's talk about Edward, shall we? Edward. So um, Edward um, was the son of Queen Victoria, right? And Queen Victoria, old Queen Victoria, dies in 1901, and um, uh, the Prince of Wales, otherwise known, the Prince of Wales, um, King Edward VII, takes the stage when he was 60 years old. So by that time, you know, he's in his 60s, and he spent most of his time being what was known as the Playboy Prince. And you can tell, uh, I, you, I'm sure you know, this probably did not set well with mother. Um, but he was a socialite. If you could think back to his mother, um, she had gone into mourning after Prince Albert, her, her beer, uh, dear, beloved uh, Prince Albert, had passed away um, in 1861. So um, she spent 40 years in mourning. And basically, the, uh, the British Empire was ready for a new breath of fresh air as you can imagine. So he had a fondness for socializing, for travel. Um, uh, you might say um, he was a party boy of his time. Um, Edward ha habitually smoked 20 cigarettes and 12 cigars a day. So it's no surprise that, um, that he came down with bronchitis in later life. And um, in May 6th of 1910, he suffered from several heart attacks, um, and then, but continues to work because the, um, there was a crisis going on. Uh, but um, at 11.30, he finally lost consciousness and was put to bed, and 15 minutes later, he had died. He had passed. So um, that, brought on, um, that brought on his brother to take, uh, take over, King George V. And if you don't know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, and now the rest of the story. 
Anyway, um, my kids at UGA, they don't know who the hell Paul Harvey is. So finally, I have a crowd who knows who Paul Harvey is. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I appreciate that. I can't tell you. But if you don't know the story there, you should rent The King's Speech. It's really a wonderful film. You should, you should rent that. But there was major changes during this period. Uh, politically, uh, the labor movement was, was taking over and, and uh, was, was coming to power, and also women's rights. So you had a whole new, they had a whole new uh, voter base there um, to, um, to deal with. But there was also bad stuff, obviously. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about these in a second. The sinking of the Titanic in 1912, and of course, the Great War, World War I, um, from 1914 to 1918. Of course, um, uh, Edward dies in, in 1910, but we talk about this period as being Edwardian, all of this, all of this period. Um, there's huge economic opportunities as a result of rapid industrialization because of the result of the war. So out of this comes uh, a, a period of wealth. Um, and uh, one of the benefits of that is uh, the automobile industry is now commonplace in cities. Just to give you a few dates, um, uh, Benz's Multivagen was built in 1885. By 1890, Puego of, of, of France is manufacturing cars. And then, of course, the Ford Motor Company it happens in 1903, so finally organizes in 1903. And so the Model T happens in October of 1908. So by that time, you know, the, the, the car is reaching not just the rich person, but now the middle class, right? Okay. Enough about all that. Now let's talk about the fun stuff, right? It's La Belle Epoque. This is the fun period, right? This is the gorgeous uh, La Belle Epoque, the beautiful era. This is the age of, of a, a conspicuous uh, consumption, right? Um, it's the golden age for U.S. upper classes. This is, um, they're reaping the benefits, the spoils of the new imperialism and the industrial revolution. Um, peace prevailed over most of, the, most of the countries until 1914, of course. Um, and those newly rich, the nouveau riche of the United States invade Europe in where they, they would take on the grand tour of Europe, right? The Vanderbilts, the Astors, the Rockefellers, all those that went glub, 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 glub down with the Titanic. Um, you've never heard that joke? What did the Titanic say to the iceberg? Glub, 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 glub. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, science and new technologies, obviously electricity um, happens and that brings the light bulb. So the light, the light bulb is, is, um, is coming to the masses. Not quite there for everyone, but, but it's coming. Um, on the art scene, we have Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau is this exciting new art form. Uh, starts in, in Vienna, uh, and France makes a very different uh, interpretation of that in incorporating plantiforms and organic shapes and asymmetrical designs. All of that um, is very exciting. You have the Impressionism. You have all of those, um, those Impressionists uh, out sipping their, uh, sipping their absinthe on the, in the streets of Montmartre um, at the Follies Bergère. Haute Couture was finally came to be in Paris. We'll talk more about that in, in a sec. And my favorite, Champagne, was perfected with Brut coming to exist in 1876. So we can't, we can't talk about this period without talking about a gentleman that really um, started the um, modern fashion designer uh, industry and really became the closest thing to, that we understand as a modern fashion designer. And that's Charles Worth. Uh, Charles Worth was um, born in uh, 1825 in England, and he had a very affluent family, but his father was an alcoholic and they lost all of it, which forced him and his mother to go to work. His mother worked as a, um, as a, a house cleaner. And he found, um, he found work in, um, in the garment industry, in the, in the fabric industry, as an accountant first, and then he slowly moved over um, he, he finally moved to Paris 
1845 and started working for a fabric company and then he told them, hey, let me take some of that fabric and, and, and make a sample dress to help sell the fabric. And that's what really got him started. It started catching the eye and that garment started selling more than just the fabric. Um, he found very, um, very uh, affluent, um, he found very affluent um, patrons, such as the French em Empress Eugene, who launched his career into the upper class. He um, changed how fashion was, um, was considered. Before this, you went to your dressmaker and she made what you uh, asked her to do, or, or he. Um, he turned that around. He said, now I'm gonna make the dress and you come to me and I'm gonna line up models and you're gonna pick out which model you like um, from that lineup. And then you order the, the dress. You probably saw that on one of the recent episodes, right? Um, of Downton Abbey, not too long ago, uh, Mary uh, goes into London and watches a fashion show. And then she writes down on her little chick what she, what she wants. But this, is, um, but this is different. He elevated um, design to a new art form. It wasn't just that you were, um, you know, a lowly dressmaker. Um, after the fall of the French uh, Second Empire, um, the nouveau riche from, from New York and Boston flood in, and he's happy to help them out with dresses. Um, I have a figure here that, um, that those clients would spend 10000 a year on their wardrobe. So on their grand tours into Europe, they would stock up. They would, they would have these dresses. They would, they would go into um, to the House of Worth, be fitted, pick out what they wanted, and, and have it all shipped back after it was finished. They would spend upwards of $10,000 a year on their wardrobe. Now, that doesn't sound like much, right? Hey, you know, TJ Maxx a couple of times, what's the problem? But let me give you that in today's terms. Today's terms, that's of $260,000 a year on their wardrobe. Now, that's for a certain level. There were some that would pay that much for a single gown. So you have different tiers there, but he was, um, he was happy to... Happy to supply. Um, he was known for ma luxurious materials and meticulous fit. Um, he really changed the way that um, garments were put together um, uh, with um, the, the patterning. Um, he got rid of excessive ruffles. He was not about um, the little dits, as we call it. Um, he was more about an overall shape, a dramatic overall shape, and he was more about graphic. Uh, large graphic um, uh, imagery. So in both of these, you can see how it's not about the little dits. It's it's a big it's a big bang there. Um, and he's also the first to have been credited with putting lap uh, labels into clothing with his name on. So here's some examples of his work, um, just to show you kind of where we're going. Hint hint of where we're going. So in 1893, this is your this is your common silhouette. Um, you see those large sleeves. What are they called? Leg of mutton. There you go. You guys know this. You don't need me. I'll just, I'll just go now. <laughs> you guys know this. But the leg of mutton sleeve was quite large in the 1890s. Um, and you ha also had this hourglass and this S curve uh, that becomes more pronounced in the 1900s. And it's like you went and popped that sleeve. The sleeve starts to melt down the arm. And it becomes much larger at the base. By 1904, that sleeve goes away and becomes much slimmer. Of course, um, as we move into 1910, all bets are off. It's a whole new world there. Uh, the waistline comes up. We have a new inspiration from ancient Greece and Asia. Um, so we have um, other inspirations that are, we'll talk about as we go on. <laughs> Nothing succeeds like excess, right? Who said that first? Who said that first? I'll read you the quote. The whole quote is, moderation is a fatal thing. <laughs> Nothing succeeds like excess. Oscar Wilde. Thank you very much. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. Prize winner.
Okay, so let's talk about this. So this, this gives you a little perspective too. Society rules uh, for, for clothing, for, for, the upper, for the upper class. So this is a, a, an everyday occasion, right? This is something you need to do every day. You wake up, you have your sleeping gown on, right? You're not naked. You are in your sleeping gown. In order to then get dressed, you have to put on a dressing gown. If you decide to take tea or uh, breakfast in your room, you have the dressing gown on for your, your lady's maid to come in um, to then get you dressed for the day. If you're heading out um, for visiting or walking um, or some slight shopping perhaps, you would wear a walking or, or visiting um, dress. Um, that's considered half dress. Um, in the afternoon, you, you come back and change again for afternoon tea. So that's where we get a tea dress from. Um, by the, um, before the evening, before dinner, you need to change again, and that is for dinner. Um, now, dinner and evening dress is a little bit different than ball and court, which I put into another category we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and then you're back to sleeping, okay? So in the minimum, you've changed at least four times, okay? So think about, um, especially ladies, think about the day that you keep today. And imagine going home, because you can't do this out, outside, right? You're not going to stop off, you know, at, at Walmart and change in the, <laughs> in the ladies' room at Walmart, right? You're, you need to stay close to home. So this is a little tether for you. You, this, you can only do so many things. You've got to get back. You've got to change. So think about the other clothing you might need as well. There's other clothing requirements. If you were, if you were touring in a car or if you're traveling on a train, it's a whole other outfit, right? Um, because trains, I don't know if you knew this, but trains are very dirty. The soot's coming off. If the windows are down, it's hot. The soot's coming in. Um, uh, of course, if you were mourning, uh, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother Oprah show, as I say. So that's a, that's a, hundred, no, a whole nother hour long lecture that we all get into right now. I'm sorry. Um, but if you're in mourning, that's a whole nother dress um, uh, and, and way of, of, of dressing. Um, obviously, there's the sport. So like bathing, bathing is a different um, dress. Um, if, and now sports are on the rise for, for, for ladies too. Um, yachting, hunting, and the most popular sport was riding. We'll say for the general populace, bicycling. Bicycling was a huge revolution for those people in 1880 and, and forward. To to have your own transportation and basically go where you wanted to go quickly was a whole nother, uh, I mean, this is just like a, a, a huge thing. You know, it was like, uh, now I have an iPhone. You know what I mean? It was like a thing like that that changed your, changed your world. Um, also, court, like I mentioned before, court dress was very different, um, as was a, a ball dress. A ball dress made for dancing, right? So think of all those different pieces, and then think of all the different pieces that go with it. So it's not just the dress, it's all the other pieces that go with it, right? Okay, so let's, let's get on to the 1890s silhouette. This is what we call the S-curve um, corset, um, or we also refer to this to the monobosom, which means that the, the ladies had a very full bosom in the front, and this was a very pronounced, almost pigeon-breasted, what we call pigeon-breasted. So there was no, there was, I hate to say it, but Mae West, there was none of this, like, you know, individual twins going on here. <laughs> this was one, one, one shape, okay? Um, we also, you, you had a little bum roll in the back. So the corset's pushing you forward, creating this shape, and then you have a little ruffle in the back, um, uh, to push out the skirt, and that's helping that shape as well. That's called the S-curve. So a little pooch in the front and a little ruffle in the back, you know, hey. Um, and also we mentioned our leg on the sleeves. So here's, um, there's Mama. Hello, Mama. So, of course, the costume designers here are, are, are uh, Downton Abbey starts in what year? 1912, thank you. And 1912. So this is an early shot from, from the show. So we're, so obviously the costume designer is telling you that from the get-go, the Ma is living in the past, 
right? She's living 10 or 20 years earlier than what we're, than what we're set right now. So this is the, this is the, you can see the full, uh, the kind of poochiness to the front of this that helps give the illusion of that, forcing the, the torso forward. But also, you've got to have underpinnings to make this work. So uh, imagine your, uh, your, your body being contorted in this way. It created a, a kind of cone shape from the uh, upper torso and the rib cage, compressing the lungs, compressing the heart, and all the other organs, squish. <laughs> yeah, it's gotta, gotta go somewhere, right? Where's it gonna go? It's gotta go down and, and out. And, um, and you can imagine the kind of internal damage that was done here. <laughs> Ladies fainting, that's a very, you know, that's, you know, now you know why, right? Um, they, these actually were sold as health, healthy um, items, they're for your health. <laughs> yes, to give you good posture, yes, and to make you healthier. I, I kind of need one now, I think I'm a little healthier. Um, but, so, let's talk about how you get, so when you get dressed, what are all the different pieces you need to wear? Um, you have a chemise, that's your under, undergarment. Uh, this could be silk or, co or cotton or linen. Um, and then you put on your drawers, pantaloons, pantalettes, bloomers, however you want to call them. And those have a split crotch for when nature calls and much easier to handle uh, that event. Um, and then the corset goes on. And then the corset gets tightened, right? Not before three o'clock, right? Um, and then the camisole goes over that, over the corset, which helps uh, ease the transition to the outer dress. Um, and then there's a petticoat. Yes? Question about the corset and like that photo in the center. Do you have an app, do you have a measurement for like what the circumference is like for a photo like that or what would have been common for a corset to, what size is that using now? Well, I would say 18 to 20 inches at this point. Okay. Um, it, it varies because you're saying like, well, where's the waist? Is the waist here? Is the waist here? Right. So, um, 18 to 20 inches. Yes. Okay. And of course, some people were more, um, shall I say, corpulent than others. So it depended on who, how you could, um, how you, you know, what, what could you achieve? So you had the petticoat and then you had the outer dress. Okay. By 1900, that S-curve continues, but it's on its way out. Um, the large sleeves we talked about already, those are, those are, those are beginning to fade. Um, okay, let's talk about one of my favorites. Hats! Who didn't love the hats, especially in that show? It's gorgeous, right? Hats were a big business in this period. Um, and these hats, um, keep in mind, and this is something I, I t remind my students about, is that the hats themselves, if you notice, they don't sit on the head. They, don't, they never touch the head or the face. They sit on the hair. So the hat is always on the hair, which is on the head, right? So you've got a much, uh, a much more pronounced um, uh, event happening there, right? Um, event, uh, hats before this were much smaller. By the end of the, uh, by the Edwardian period, at its height, they were quite large. Um, but the one thing that I want to point out here is the uh, egrets. And egrets are basically the French word for egret, right? Doesn't take too long to figure that out. And that's basically, if you've been to Florida and you're south of here, you've seen a cowbird. You know what a cowbird is, right? And these egrets um, uh, were um, sought after for, especially in the springtime, for their spring plumage. That was the number one um, type of bird. Um, the plumes sold for around $32 an ounce in 1915. That was the same price as gold. So keep that in mind. Millinery, uh, millinery at this point was a $17 million a year industry. That is over $400 million today. So if you could think of, it could compete with any tech company that's, uh, that's rolling out there right now. But it comes at a price. 
By the 19th century, plume hunters had nearly wiped out the egret population in the United States and in Florida. Um, the number of birds that were used, flamingos, rosette spoonbills, great egrets, peafowl, um, the, great, the empress of Germany's bird of paradise, that's the one with the kind of lyre-shaped tail feather. Those were all targeted. Um, so let me, I'm going to read this quote to you because I think this is really fascinating. In 1886, uh, Frank Chapman hiked from his uptown Manhattan office to the heart of women's fashion district on the 14th Street to tally the stuffed birds on the hats of passing women. He identified the wings, heads, tails, or entire bodies of three bluebirds, two red-headed woodpeckers, nine Baltimore Orioles, five blue jays, 21 common terns, a saw wheat owl, a prairie hen. In two afternoon trips, he counted 174 birds and 440 species in all. So um, this was a major, major impact on the bird populations. Um, in South Florida alone, they were nearly destroyed because the, the, they were going after the egrets' um, springtime feathers. So what would happen is uh, they would attack the nesting, they would take the, uh, the males out and uh, defeather them right there and then, leaving the chicks to die. And so very quickly that, that population got decimated. Until Miss August um, Hemingway in 1896 got her ladies who lunch. I still wear a hat, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, the ladies who lunch, uh, she got her ladies together in Boston and she started the Audubon Society as a result of this kind of carnage that was happening in the, uh, the millinery. So you, can, um, so you can thank her for that. Okay, so um, <laughs> move on, Debbie Downer. The hats are beautiful. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> okay, let's talk about the guys for a minute because they don't get out of this area very easy either. Um, uh, a gentleman, um, they were required to change clothes as well. And the top of that would be what we consider white tie, right? This is something we're sort of familiar with today. Uh, what we're not familiar with is wearing it to, to uh, dinner, not diner. You don't wear it to the diner. Wear it to the dinner. Um, you need to wear it to the balls. Um, opera or theater. In fact, opera still continues that tradition. Uh, if you're going to an evening wedding, and of course, um, court and state affairs uh, dictated that you wear um, white tie. Of course, that, that, um, that entails a, a black or midnight blue dress coat, um, trousers and matching fabric, uh, plain white stiff cotton shirt with uh, a white PK dickie. And if you're used to watching old Laurel and Hardy films and all that, you're used to that thing coming up and flapping. That was endless hours of fun, right? The dicky would come up and flap them in the face. So you know what that is. Um, a stiff uh, a white collar, um, sometimes made out of paper, sometimes made out of, for the, for the middle class. And my grandmother would talk about her, her mother wearing one out of Isinglass. Any idea what Isinglass is? It's an early plastic kind of thing. So the collar is made out of Isinglass. Um, so a low-cut uh, low uh, PK waistcoat. A waistcoat is a vest for all of you Americans in the audience tonight. Um, and then black court pumps or opera pumps. That's, uh, that's full dress. Or if you want to dress down, hey, you know, why don't you wear a morning suit? Um, a morning suit was originally called a morning suit because gentlemen headed out um, to ride in the morning. Um, so that's generally, or they went a calling or um, took care of some business. So that was um, considered um, the sort of lesser of the formal uh, wear. Um, you could also wear it for weddings. It became sort of synonymous with gay weddings, especially, um, as, well as, as well as the races. So the races had an all gray version. So if you think of the ascot scene, all gray um, morning suit there. Uh, it was very similar to the, the formal, but the pieces didn't need to match. The, coat, the cutaway coat um, could be black or navy or gray, as I mentioned before. The, the vest could be contrasting. The pants were usually striped or checkered. Um, again, shirt, ascot or cravat, right? 
Um, and you top that off with a top hat and gloves, spats, watch chain, fob, boutonniere, and pocket square, and you are ready to hit the road. <laughs> now, we've all seen the tuxedo come on the stage, especially with um, in the recent episodes of, of Downton Abbey. Um, tuxedo's got an interesting past. We all think, um, if you've probably heard the stories about why the tuxedo was named tuxedo, and the Americans like to claim that, uh, uh, to stake that claim, that it was invented in a tuxedo park resort in New York, upstate New York. Um, but if we do a little bit more digging, you know there's old Prince of Wales, uh, Playboy Edward out there, and he supposedly ordered um, a smoking jacket that was tailless to wear to dinner um, in 1860 when he was a young'un. And um, uh, he ordered uh, his tailor on Seville Row to create this suit. It was, it was a matching, it was a velvet jacket with matching pants that he was going to wear um, at his country estate. And that is where we really um, trace the beginning of the tuxedo back to. Uh, said that uh, folks that went over to Europe saw that and, and brought it back with them. But anyway, uh, we don't want to hear that because we're American, so we want to we want to stake the claim that no, 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 we created it. And that would go back to, if you believe our story, um, back to Tuxedo Park, where the son of a wealthy tobacco uh, magnate, um, Griswold Loylard, and his friends decided to show up for the, um, for the um, autumn ball by cutting off their tails and wearing red vest. Um, and it was such a shock that it came up in the paper, the town topics, the leading society magazine of the day, says, um, and the only publication basically in, in Tuxedo Park, New York, um, they recorded the incident. They, they compared the boys to royal footmen, adding they ought to have been put in straight jackets long ago. <laughs> so there you go. So it was also called a dinner jacket. It's an alternative to tails. Guys, uh, gentlemen, um, uh, during the day, typically would wear, um, rather than the, uh, the semi-formal cutaway, Typically, what was worn during the day was what we, we consider what's called a sack suit. So it doesn't sound very appealing, though, does it? It's like a sack suit. Um, well, that's, that's because before this, gentlemen would wear a frock coat. And the frock coat was a shaped piece. It had a, it had a, um, it had a waist seam, and it was a very shaped piece. This, nah, none of that. It was a square, as far as they concerned. It was very square, and it looked like a sack and it got the, the name stuck. Um, generally, the, 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 the coat and the pants matched with a contrasting vest, or you could have it all made out of the same material and that would be called a ditto suit. Um, new to this was the trousers getting um, a little shorter and having a cuff, a little, little cuff, and being creased. So now the, the clothes, have, they've got a press, they can process these clothes a lot easier. So. Um, so they've got, a, they've got a press there to put those in. Um, again, it's inspired by sportswear. Sports are big on the st stage. Um, okay, so also hats. No dead birds here, you notice. So we, it's a happy moment, right? So just hold on to that. I haven't destroyed every, every drink you've had yet, right? Okay. Um, so the hats, uh, generally the gentleman, uh, a top hat was what was required for formal wear, but there were several other hats that came into, uh, into uh, popularity. Um, the number one uh, is the Hamburg, and the Hamburg, again, there's, there's uh, Edward traipsing over to, to Germany and saw this style in Hamburg and, um, and brought it back and thus the name. Um, in 1904, um, the, the Panama Canal is being built. So the Panama hat, the Panama Canal, uh, comes from uh, that region of the world. Uh, and, a, and pictures of Teddy Roosevelt wearing a Panama ha hat helped push it uh, into popularity as well. The fedora, um, the fedora was the title of an 1882 play um, 
where Sarah uh, Bernhardt was playing, a famous, a famous actress, the, the famous actress, Sarah Bernhardt, right? Um, and she was playing uh, Princess Fedora, and she was wearing a center crease, soft-brimmed hat, and that's where that uh, came from. The bowler um, at the bottom, another one that's very popular, um, the bowler was uh, made by London hat makers Thomas and William Bowler, um, that was commissioned by uh, a gentleman by the name of Coke, who wanted the gamekeepers to be able to ride their uh, uh, ride without their top hats getting knocked off. And every time the top hats get knocked off, they're busted on the ground, right? Because um, they're very they're very fragile. So he had um, he had the bowlers commission, and it said that he tested them when he went to pick up the the first one. He threw it on the ground and stomped on it twice, and it didn't dent and it was sold. So from that point on, the, the, the bowler was, uh, was a part of history. And um, it's interesting, an interesting note that the Derby actually outsold cowboy hats in the Wild West. The Derby was the, the hat that, uh, that uh, conquered the Wild West, not the cowboy hat. That was the most popular hat at the time. On the right, you see a, a, what we call Italian driving hat. That's a coppola, or we get the word cap, an Italian cap. That's um, sort of synonymous, synonymous with this period as well, um, especially for um, the hunting, a hunting look or sporting look. Um, again, the, the Nouveau Riche are, are headed to, um, to parts in Italy. They encounter this one in Sicily. Okay, speaking of hunting wear, we get a lot of hunting wear on the show, um, and this is a great time to show you this um, suit. This is called the Norfolk suit, um, either um, named after the Duke of Norfolk or, again, Edward has an estate in Norfolk. So this becomes very, um, very popular, um, centered around Edward's life. Um, it was very handy for hunting because it had extra room in the, uh, in the arm. And when you raised your arm up to shoot, it had this outer belt that kept the suit together and down. So that belting that, uh, that you see on the, um, it's my laser pointer. <laughs> you see on the, the suit there, oh, high tech. Now we're like 21st century here. Uh, you can see that small belt there, that kept everything together and, um, and, and tight to the body. So that's a Norfolk. Okay, so we gotta bring it up because it's a biggie. Um, these two events will start to change now history. Um, the Titanic sinking in 1912, um, over 1,200 losing their lives. This was an epic event that um, that really shaped, began the um, sort of rude awakening for, um, for the Belle, La Belle Epoque. Um, it, this was a time when, you know, everything was optimistic. We can do anything. We can make anything. We can make this ginormous city uh, on and put it into the sea and it's, it's going to be unsinkable. For it to happen like that uh, really shook uh, Western society. Um, and then, of course, much larger is the Great War, which um, really decimated Europe from 1914 to 1918 and changed really the Western civilization. Just to put it in context, there's 37 million that um, are killed in this war. Uh, today, there's 8.4 million people living in New York City. So if you want to double, empty out all five boroughs of New York City four times over, then you get the number of people that perished uh, from this war. And that was um, one of the uh, civilization's greatest calamities. Um, and this, I don't know if any of you caught this in the news on the right, um, this, this uh, Armistice Day celebration or a memorial in, in, in uh, Britain, this is just, these were red poppies, they were made, like ceramic red poppies, uh, sculptures that were made and placed all around the moat of the Tower of London. Uh, they represent every single British person that perished uh, in the British uh, Commonwealth. So, and it literally filled the moat there. So that's just England, um, just to give you a little perspective. 
Okay, so this um, this sort of puts in place a whole new mind change. Um, lots of people are, are woken up to this. Uh, you get, uh, as far as fashion goes, you get an immediate change from uh, the 19, uh, 1890s to 1910. You get uh, a very different silhouette. So we'll talk about that. 1910, um, uh, very drapey skirts. Um, the, the waistline is much higher. Again, like I mentioned before, it was, um, it was especially here, you can see how the Greek uh, ketons, even in the hair, um, you can see how it, it uh, is symbolic of the, the Greek knot. But you see much higher uh, waistlines. Um, during the day, I mean, this is utterly shocking. The fact that this much leg would be um, shown six to eight inches from the floor could be shown. Um, that was again a, a huge shocker. Um, and the emphasis on the low hip. So on the low area of the hip, something today you would think, ah, no, 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 I don't want to go anywhere near that, right? That's the last place I want to emphasize is that, right? So of course you need underpinnings to do all of that with. Uh, it can't happen for free. Um, so this, so the corset's not gone quite yet. We're, we're trying to get it away, and there's a couple of people working very hard to get rid of it, believe me. Um, but the, the corset's this long line, you can see the torso, it's, it's, that S shape is nearly gone, um, but you have this very long line look there. <clears throat> One of the folks that, um, that brings about this change is um, the king of fashion, Paul Poiré. And Paul Perret, um, uh, whose story starts out uh, very similar to that of, of Charles Worth, um, as um, nearly um, uh, very poor, grew up very poor, and, um, and made himself into this, um, uh, this uh, key figure in, in fashion. Um, he was able to, uh, he first connected with, he actually worked with Worth in 1901, and then he found his own house in 1903. Um, he's, he's credited with totally dispatching the corset. Um, he's also, lived, first he started with a petticoat in 1903, and then the corset in 1906. He's also given credit for inventing the bra. That's sort of like the Wright brothers were the first ones to fly and all that. <laughs> you know how that goes. It's whoever has the better press agent, right? And that's a good. That's the one thing the Poiré was fantastic at is theatrics, and he knew how to um, who how to work the crowd, so to speak. Um, he was excellent at that. He was very he was very tied to Ballet Russe. We mentioned Ballet Russe earlier. Um, that the, that uh, emphasis on Orientalism, uh, romantic, uh, theatrical, um, all of that was brought into his, um, his designs. He's best known for um, the coat, the Poiré coat, which totally was the exact opposite. If you think of what we had 10 years prior to this, it was the exact opposite. Um, sort of large um, draped garments. So instead of it being this tailored, meticulously tailored wool thing, this is now silk, uh, the finest silk from Lyon. And it's on the bias, and it's, and it's a square cut piece, but we're gonna throw it on the bias, and it's gonna drape. And then there's gonna be a large, um, there's gonna be a large sleeve. These were very complex um, garments that uh, looked very simple, uh, but were very complex. Um, he also understood the concept of total lifestyle. He was one of the first uh, designers to uh, market a perfume named after his daughter. Um, he also had an interior design uh, leg of his, of his um, design house. Um, so he was a pivotal person in, in design. These are some of his more theatrical um, things. Uh, I've mentioned Ballet Russe. Uh, Ballet Russe came to town with the uh, Scheherazade um, and Scheherazade was very uh, informative to creation of um, the harem pants. The harem pants um, were in 1911, and you saw Rose show up uh, and shocked everyone, right? You remember that episode? 
I'm sorry, Sim. I'm sorry, Sim. Yeah, absolutely not. I'm sorry. That's been too many episodes ago. Um, but he also did pieces for um, for costume balls. That was a big thing at the time. Was fancy dress balls. I'm sorry, fancy dress balls as they're called in England. Um, the lampshade dress was also one of his inventions um, in 1913. Um, and as you can imagine, again, that over-exaggeration of the, exactly the part that most women don't want to have anything to do with, right? So um, those were short-lived, short-lived, as you can imagine. The, the, war, uh, the war brought about a new emphasis on the role of women. The, um, the women had to, uh, men are off at the war, the majority of men um, of, of any age, of any age, not just the young, the old, everybody went to this war. Um, and women had to take up uh, a lot of the responsibilities back home. And thus, um, this uh, emphasis on getting down to business. And this, um, the tayora is uh, one of the garments, the, the suit, basically, for women's wear, um, that was very popular at the time. Um, it was worn during the city, basically for city, uh, I mean, worn during the day for city um, and, and travel use. Another interesting invention of uh, Mr. Poré is the hobble skirt. Um, the hobble skirt was this kind of odd little oddity and um, has a little story that goes behind it. So, so Poiré supposedly observed the behavior of, uh, of Hart O'Berg, who apparently saw, was at an air show where Wilbur Wright was showing off this new invention, this aeroplane. Okay? And she was so excited about this, she wanted to have a go at it. So he strapped her skirt closed. They closed up the skirt at the legs so it wouldn't fly all over the place. Put her on the plane. And uh, for about two and a half minutes, she flew. So she's the first American uh, and woman was a passenger uh, uh, the first female passenger of a flight um, having her skirt. And when she got off the plane, Poré noticed how she hobbled away from the plane, and he thought that was a good idea for a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that's how the story goes. So um, they con concocted this, uh, this idea. Um, oftentimes there was an interior band that um, otherwise you would rip the skirt if you just pushed against the fabric of the skirt itself. Uh, so there was an interior band that kept the legs together to keep that from, from ripping away. Um, yeah, you can imagine it didn't have a, a long life, the hobble skirt. Here's a couple of versions of, of evening wear um, from this period. Um, I can't mention this period without talking about Fortuny. Um, if you uh, know about Fortuny, um, a, a Spanish, um, I'm sorry, uh, yes, a Spanish um, couture house opened in, um, in 1906. He was known for this incredible pleading, um, and he kept this, uh, he patented this idea, um, and, and it remains a secret to this day. They cannot be replicated. These um, dresses on the, on the far right, your far right, is a Fortuny dress. Um, when they were purchased, they were bought in a little box about like this, and that's how you carried your dress home in this little box. It just curled right up and into the box it goes. Um, of course, uh, these were expensive little boxes, <laughs> as you can imagine, and now those are sought after. Um, we, have re we, have, um, we have a price of $10,000 going for one on sale in, in 2001, so. I'm sure they've gone up from them. Um, we mentioned sporting life before, so here's some different outfits. You can think about this the next time you go, you go down to Tybee Island or Myrtle Beach, you can take your swimsuit right there. Um, so very specific looks for, for, uh, for uh, sportswear. Um, here's your cycling outfit. So you think about those ladies that are running around the, you think about what it is now. But here's your here's your cycling outfit. 
1912 bathing. And of course, there's the touring. Again, the roadways are not anywhere near what they are today. So very dusty, dirty kind of place. You want to cover up as much as possible. That's why you have the veil and goggles. Um, and then also head to the gym. Look at that. I think Lulu should get a hold of that and uh, maybe try that out at the next yoga. <laughs> Okay, so we finally get into the, the Roaring Twenties, and um, this is a whole new attitude. The war ended in 19, uh, 1918, and the uh, Western world has a whole new lookout on life. It is carpe diem. It is devil may care, because you never know when the next time this is going to roll around again. So appreciating, appreciating what you have, um, almost to the point of, um, well, it does get crazy for a while. Um, but the party, uh, the party continues at least uh, until the end of the decade um, before the Great Crash. The posterity uh, was, um, was high um, again after the war. Um, jazz hits the, hits the stage. So the first jazz record was uh, released in 1917, and it was uh, the original Dixieland jazz bands, Dixie Jazz Band One Step, and Livery Stable Blues. Those that was the that was the first jazz record that was put out on February 26, 1917. Um, you have the incredible popularity of travel now, uh, automobiles, planes, and of course cruise ships. Right, anything goes. Um, uh, that is all, uh, that people are on the move, in other words. Um, we have telephones now that, uh, that help us with communication, and Hollywood comes on the scene with the startup of the, um, of the uh, motion picture industry. Of course, first there's, this, uh, there's, the, there's the silent films and then the talkies. And electricity becomes more available to uh, common households. So all of that, um, you can imagine, uh, major changes in life. One of the biggest uh, uh, art movements that's happening at this point is Art Deco. And this is a whole new art form. Until now, we really have been basing everything on classical themes. It goes all the way back to Greece and neoclassicism, and neoclassicism again, and neoclassicism again. So the Baroque period is sort of a take on that. The Rococo is sort of a, a take on that. So this um, really is a whole other break from that, and that's based on ge uh, geometric patterns, um, abstraction of light, abstraction of speed. Now we start to understand what aerodynamics need mean. And so that aerodynamic finds its way into the aesthetic of everything, uh, from lamps to buildings, to, um, to elevator doors, to radios. Um, we have a huge influence from Japan and classical Greece, but the biggie is Egypt. Can anybody tell me what's the connection from Downton Abbey to Egypt? Lord Carnarvon, exactly. Lord Carnarvon, um, who um, is the uh, Howard Carter's backer, um, is actually the Lord of Highkirk Castle, which is the setting of Downton Abbey. So, if you go today, in fact, to um, to tour um, uh, to to tour Highkirk Castle. In the basement, they actually have replicas um, and some of the actual artifacts from the, um, from the King Tut uh, excavations. And that was in 1922, by the way. And that had a major impact on, on things. And you saw the fashion show. You might, have, uh, you might have seen one of the dresses, one of the beaded dresses was sort of uh, a la Egypte. Okay, so 1920s. Uh, uh, just as streamlined as they um, saw those vehicles and airplanes and cars, um, that was the uh, that was the push for this mode as well. Um, some the straight, flat, streamlined. So uh, yes, finally the corset is gone away. If you happen to be flat chested and look like a, a, a bean pole, um, if you don't, then you're back in a girdle. And, and there were emphasis, there were things that tried to smooth you out 
or you had to wear a band and, and try to tie the ladies down, do whatever you can to create this, this look. And this look was called La Garçon. Um, uh, so Coco Chanel uh, turned this, uh, this, this term, coin, coin, turned this phrase, I guess is the right way, La Garçon, and that means the boy, of course. So I like a boy, a little bob haircut and very, uh, very straight um, appearance. Um, skirts rise, uh, hips lower and skirts rise. So the hip uh, comes down, uh, the waist goes down to the hip. I'm sorry, I'm running out of it. The waist goes down to the hip and the skirts come up. So this is the highest the skirts have been in, in history since, since classical periods. Um, drape and tailoring takes on new importance. Um, we'll talk about Coco in a second, but, um, but jersey and sportswear is very important. Um, and of course, graphic decoration. So goodbye corset. Here's what you're wearing underneath all that um, if you happen to uh, be able to pull it off. <laughs> that's, the, that's the key phrase, right? Being able to pull it off. <clears throat> so we can't talk about this period without talking about Coco, right? Coco um, Chanel, um, like many of the other designers, had a very humble beginnings. Um, she survived, she was born in 1883, and she survived a very impoverished childhood and a very strict education. Um, she first started out as an actress, and that's where she got the name Coco, and as a milliner, something again near to my heart. Um, uh, Chanel opened her first shop in 1913 in Paris, uh, but more importantly, and also in the resort town of Devaux. Um, and this is where she really excelled, was in the resort wear. Because uh, when, the, uh, when uh, the war broke out and folks left Paris to escape that, they're in the resort town, and that's where she becomes more, uh, more famous. Um, she particularly loved Jersey, uh, and Jersey uh, allowed, was not only cheap and available at the time, but it also allowed to hug the body so you could have this nice, long, elongated um, shape. And it also, um, it also draped nicely. And she also uh, featured separate. So there was a cardigan sweater, there was pleated skirts. Things <coughs> became much easier and, and, and um, more approachable than we've ever seen before. She also created, we couldn't talk about, um, uh, about Chanel without talking about the LBD, right? Everybody knows about the LBD. So in 1926, little, back, little black dress, thank you for the, <laughs> for the boyfriends in the room. <laughs> the little black dress, um, in 1926, American Vogue likened Chanel's little black dress to the Ford, alluding to its almost universal popularity as a fashion basic. Um, but all this ties back into Chanel's lifestyle herself. Uh, she's a modern woman. She's in a man's world, basically, dominated by these other these men fashion designers, right? She's uh, got this boyish, slim boyish figure, cropped hair, tan skin. Now it's posh to have a tan skin, once again. That means that you have leisure time. That means that you spend your time sporting or yachting. So that's a good thing. Um, and all of this, and she had financial ind independence. And that was like, you know, the, that's what made her such a hot, hot commodity, was that she no longer were clientele taking orders from, from men. They felt like they had a, a compatriot with them that was on this, that was making them look gorgeous in a feminine way. Um, her... Um, of course, she, uh, she closed um, uh, during when the Nazis invaded in 1939, and it took her a while to get going again. She really, um, she wasn't sure about reopening, um, but she did in response, especially to Christian Dior. She saw New Christian New York Dior's after the war, World War II, we're talking now. She saw him um, with this new look, and she felt like, well, Ladies are pinched in waist again. Now they have a little, uh, they have a little pannier underneath the skirt. She loved the idea, but it didn't seem to her to be the modern woman. So she reopened in 1953, 
as a response. And that's when she returned to status about three years later. Um, and she brought back with her the suits, the things that made her famous. The suits, the tweed suits, a boxy, uh, simple cut suit, no lapel, braided and um, trimmed out, had a little chain in it to keep the weight, keep that sort of shape. Um, and she, um, she was able to sell that to a new generation of, of status seekers. Um, so if you need to know more, just look at Jackie Kennedy. And, and that's all that's all that needs to be said. She passed away in 1971, um, after which her her assistants took over until Lagerfeld took over the company or became the head designer in 1983. So that continues today, obviously. Okay, one of our favorite topics um, is the flapper, right? Our favorite bad girls um, from this period. Um, flappers were a direct response um, to all this madness happening after the war. And their little breeding ground where um, flappers really got started was in Berlin. In Berlin, in this, in this time period, um, if you're familiar with cabaret or letters from Berlin, you're, you, you get a sense of what this must have been like. Fraud Sally Bowles, right? Um, this is a time period when anything goes, basically. Uh, smoking, drinking, sex, promiscuous sex, sex with the uh, other gender, sex with the same gender, uh, cross, all kind of cross bending going on there. Um, so much the exact opposite of what the Edwardian Victorian period. You could not get any more opposite than than this this mentality. And it really, and I mean, you can think of it as a fallout from that war. The war really unsettled reality. And for, for most of these gals, they found this new life invigorating and um, they, didn't, they weren't looking back, right? So they're known for um, uh, petting parties was very, very popular. Um, so petting parties where you go and neck out and... Uh, and uh, that's their term. This is in quotes. Sorry, <laughs> that's a, one of the slang words uh, that we got from the from the flappers was necking. Um, they're famous for their bobbed hair, their rolled down stocking, their rouge knees, um, or the or the stockings would be shredded, and you could see um, you could see thick skin through the stocking. Was another popular one. Skirts were above the knee. Um, Dark eyes with coal, so really smoky eyes, and um, and one of my favorite uh, is the galosh. Um, so wearing galoshes. Um, I found this really great um, article from the New York Times in 1922. Um, you know what galoshes are, right? Everyone knows what galoshes. Yeah. Okay. So um, the reporter went out on the street and interviewed a flapper, and um, he came and um, he talked to her. Uh, to find out what this what's what's this deal? The galoshes were worn unbuckled, so that they would flop around, you know. So you've got this really beautiful dress, you know, really loosey goosey here, and then you've got these ugly men's shoes, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, like like fireman's boots, right, with a with a clasp on it, unlatched. And so I'm just going to read this out, so um, you can it, it well just take. It. Take it as it is. 1922, streets of New York. Um, well, are, are you absent-minded, you say? Forgot to buckle your galoshes? She says, everybody's wearing them. Oh no, she retorts with a look of a mingled um, pity, tolerance, scorn, and resentment with which the true flapper receives any suggestions from her elders. All the, all the girls are wearing them that way. He says, uh, for war, the, the reason. You ask. Of course, she explains, you couldn't be expected to know. You're still living in at least last year. <laughs> but you have uh, perhaps heard that there is a, a movie play. I love, I love that idea. It's a movie play. Yeah, The Three Musketeers, uh, in which Douglas Fer F uh, Fairbanks is in. Um, he plays Dardillon. Um, you may remember uh, having seen in the... Uh, in the long ago illustration, illustrated editions of Mr. Dumas' uh, novel, 
showing Darion in his um, musketeer costume. And you may possibly remember that he wore boots with turned down tops, which flopped as he walked. It's merely that us girls are following the style set by uh, Darion. You feel so sort of swashbuckly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so copying that. <laughs> When you walk along with your overshoe tops flopping around your legs, and then it, and it does attract attention to you, which was the other key thing. Uh, the reporter goes on to mention that, uh, he, that they would scare dogs with the, the noise that they were making. He also says, with the sport shoes, the flapper wears heavy woolen stockings of the gaudiest hues and designs, the nearer to exciting a riot. So, um, so that was uh, that to look into um, into the f world of the flapper. So I think I might hear a gong somewhere <laughs> happening upstairs. I'll I'll end on this note. Um, I would love it if you guys would sometimes consider joining us at the Department of Theater for our shows at the Fine Arts Theater. Um, we're right there on the corner of um, Baldwin and Lumpkin, so we're really we're really easy to find right on the corner. So thank you very much for having me tonight. I appreciate it. <laughs>